Thank you, Isha, and thank you, everyone. Um, I just want to start by saying what uh, an honor and a privilege it is to be here with all of you, 350 people, then you know you're talking about something interesting and important. And what, a, what an incredible collaboration it's been uh, with DepEd, IPA, and it's been great to, to, to connect with EDCOM and, and uh, Philippines Institute for Development Studies and just everyone here. I, I think what we've done is actually quite historic, and I'm going to talk about a few reasons why. Uh, let me just share my screen. And I think both Dr. Obeta and, and Jeff Boynisha have set this up so well. So the, the title of this research that we've been doing, we've called it Building Resilience in Education Systems. Uh, and I'm going to talk specifically about the effectiveness of this M Education program, but I also want to zoom out to kind of broader issues in, in the education sector. One thing I also want to say, I'm sure many of us have heard of learning loss, and I think something that's refreshing today is we're not just talking about the loss, we're also talking about some solutions, which is very nice uh, in terms of things we can do to address learning loss. Okay, so Youth Impact, we, we covered. Uh, we are a non-governmental organization uh, that is committed to scaling up and generating evidence uh, in health and education. We run lots of studies, we scale things, we work with governments uh, and so forth. I think Jeff Boy covered this. This work on M education, uh, the initial study came from Botswana. That's where Youth Impact is headquartered. We actually generated the world's first evidence on distance education anywhere in the world. And we did it within a few months of school closures in the pandemic. Schools closed in March of 2020. And then by uh, April, we already had some results. And by July, we had a paper out. And for those here who are familiar, that is very unusual speed, but that is what the challenge required. And we ran a randomized control trial. And this phone-based program worked. I mean, it improved learning. We published it in Nature Human Behavior and it got a lot of attention. And the program was effective. It was some of the first evidence during the pandemic and it was cheap and it was cost-effective. So there was tremendous interest around the world to replicate this. And I'm gonna jump to the results of what we found as we replicated this. So Jepway shared uh, that we had then done this uh, across five countries beyond Botswana, including in the Philippines with DepEd and IPA. We also did it in other countries, in Kenya, in Nepal, in India, in Uganda. Now, there's a few things that were historic about the Philippine study and the five country study uh, beyond Botswana. One is, I believe this is actually one of DepEd's first randomized trials in education. So that's really exciting just to see DepEd leading the charge on rigorous evidence production on these kinds of solutions. And DepEd has just been a, such a fantastic lead and, and partner of this, this study and effort. And the other thing that is historic is there's very few studies that happen across multiple countries at the same time. Often we have one study in one place, but not in another. And so the question becomes, okay, it worked somewhere, but can it scale? Can it scale with the government? And one of the really unusual things is we tested this both across five countries. And in the Philippines, we actually had one uh, study that was with uh, teacher aides and IPA was more involved, but one was government teachers. And it was, it was really led uh, by DepEd. So we can see if this can work with the system, not just in a small study. And what you can see here with the results is in all five countries, the phone call combined with the SMS, it worked. Those green arrows mean it worked. It's kind of amazing. And it worked everywhere. I, we've almost never seen that happen. So sometimes it works one place, but not elsewhere. The fact that it works everywhere is historic. This is something that can really, really work and scale. And you can see in the Philippines, it worked particularly well, 0.45 standard deviations. Now, bear with me. We don't all love standard deviations. So I'm going to come to talk about what that actually means in practice, but that's big. Okay, The average effect in education is 0.1. Actually, half of things in education don't work at all. The things that do work, it's 0.1. So 0.45 is big. So what happened in the Philippines was really exciting, and, and it's generating a lot of interest. So this is really, really exciting and historic. Now, why is this working so well? I think Dr. Orbeta set this up so nicely. 
at it's the platform and the pedagogy. So it's the platform in that it's the phone, right? Dr. Abeta showed there's just not that much access to internet. Something didn't quite work out with phone and TV, but almost everyone has a phone. It's a way to reach people where they are in a way they're comfortable. And we're not using phones enough to reach people with education. The other thing to keep in mind about the phone is it was a phone call. It wasn't a fancy app. It was very simple. We all call our friends and family and we just called. And so this is tutoring, it's targeted instruction over the phone. So the phone helps reach people where they are in a way that they're comfortable. The other thing uh, is the pedagogy. So it's focused on foundational literacy and numeracy. Uh, it's focused on reaching children at their level, targeting instruction to their level. A child who can't add is taught to add. A child who can't subtract is taught to subtract. That sounds very obvious, but we know that often doesn't happen in the education system. Often in the education system, we follow a curricula and maybe the curricula says my grade five student is supposed to know fractions, but they can't count, but we still teach them fractions, right? So we're not teaching at their level. And so the idea is to assess them and use that assessment to teach at their level. So it's the platform and it's the pedagogy and it's combining best practices like tutoring, uh, like targeted instruction, and so we're really seeing it work everywhere. It's historic. I mean, I have to say, this is one of the most exciting efforts and studies I've, I've ever been a part of and maybe ever will. So thank you everyone who, who made this happen. It's so exciting. And it's cheap, less than $12 per child, uh, less than $6.50 in, in of course your, your local currency, right? So this is affordable, this can scale. It, it's very exciting. Okay, I'm trying to go to the next. Okay, now, I said that we did it both with an NGO delivery and also with a government delivery. Oh, sorry, let me actually go back. One thing I should also say, we didn't only test the phone call. We also tested what happens if you only have an SMS. The SMS only results were less exciting. Okay, so in some places they work, in some places they didn't. And even when they work, they don't work as well. So there's something about the SMS but it's not enough. You kind of need the phone call to get the really exciting results. Okay. Now I said that there was this study both with the NGO and with the government. And so what you can see here, this is results from Philippines and Nepal where in both of those countries, we had government and NGO delivery separated. And you can see the government effects were as big, if not slightly bigger than the NGO. Again, this is also very exciting because it's working with government teachers and in the government system. So we're really excited to explore the potential for scale with DepEd and partners. Uh, it looks like it can, and, and we're excited to take those steps. Okay, since we don't all love standard deviations, what does this actually mean? Okay, so here what you can see here is proficiency. Okay, how many kids can add? How many kids can subtract? How many kids can multiply? How many kids can divide? Okay, keep in mind these kids are in grades three and four. So one thing I wanna draw your attention to, if you look at the far right, only 3% of children in the control group, kids who are not getting an intervention can divide in grade three and four, 3%. If I'm not mistaken, I believe that is a grade level expectation. That means 3% of children can reach that. So there is a learning crisis, right? And it's, you know, we were missing some of the foundational skills. Now this is true in many places. Uh, of course, it's not just true in, in the Philippines. And I know many in the room here have been sounding the alarm on this for, for some time. What you can see is in the treatment group where they're receiving the program, you go from 3% to essentially 17, 18% can divide. Okay, so that is 15% percentage point improvement in just three hours, three hours, 20 minutes once a week for eight weeks. Okay, so what does that mean? If you did this program for essentially one week full time, almost all children could divide. Okay, so children have been in grades, you know, one, two, three, four, and they can't divide, but in one week you can do this. So not all hope is lost. We can get there, there's ways to do it. The challenge now is how do we scale these things that can really work? And you can see the gains are really big in multiplication and subtraction uh, across the board. These are big, a multiplication from 23 to 46% doubling in just three hours. So there's things that can work. And the challenge before us now is, is, is scaling this actually. 
Another thing I wanted to highlight, I mentioned that it's the platform, it's the phone call, and it's also the pedagogy. It's the targeting of the instruction, teaching to the children's level, not just a one size fits all syllabus. Now, how targeted was the instruction? We measured that. Okay. Was it the case that child's, children who couldn't add were taught addition, children who couldn't subtract were taught subtraction? It's actually not that easy to target instruction. We found in the study in the Philippines, 65% of the time instruction was targeted, which is very good, actually. In fact, it was better than our original study in Botswana, where we targeted instruction 41% of the time. That's one of the reasons we think it worked so well in the Philippines. So as we think about scaling, one question is how to make sure the instruction is still very well targeted. Now on the far left, what I wanna draw your attention to is what we find is when you don't have programs like this, what percentage of the instruction is targeted? Less than 1%, 0.9. So this is a huge revolution in trying to get the instruction taught at the right level of the child, uh, but it's possible and it works. Okay. The other thing is not only did this approach work, People liked it. That's always good news. You know, if it works and people don't like it, it's going to be very hard to scale politically, right? But people like it. 97% of parents and caregivers said they liked it. And another feature of what we were doing here is the phone calls were happening to the household. And, you know, parents were, you know, they were given options. They could either put the phone on speaker and leave. They could put the phone on speaker and stay or they could co-participate. We left it up to, to the parents, but they loved it. They loved seeing that their children were getting something. Uh, and because they were often the ones who had the phone and they passed it to their child. Sometimes it was a sibling, a grandparent, a cousin, whoever was available, we, we worked with. People liked it. It was kind of amazing. So I think there's lots of themes here. There's things around technology. There's things around effective pedagogy. There's things around caregiver engagement. And these challenges aren't going away. Dr. Orbeta showed that still there's lots of blended learning approaches, and I'm going to touch on more of those things. So we, we still need this. We always need to engage caregivers and parents in education. There's benefits beyond learning. We found big benefits actually for children's ambition level and their love of learning. Uh, because they're enjoying and getting attention through the phone and one-on-one, -on -one, uh, we saw some of these other things improve as well. And I mentioned cost-effectiveness. It's actually one of the most cost-effective approaches in education period. So it's not just cost-effective in general, it's one of the most cost-effective. Now, another thing that happened, as of course everyone here knows, knows all too well, is during this period, there was a typhoon, a typhoon Rai, and that was another disruption. It wasn't just COVID that was disrupting schools. And I've come to learn that this is actually very common uh, in the world, in the Philippines. The program kept working. It's kind of amazing. And so even though the typhoon itself reduced learning because uh, you know, it disrupted school even further, when we followed up, we saw that kids who were in the phone call group, they still had benefits, not all was lost. So we're seeing that this can persist through multiple types of, of disruption. Here's a figure of disruptions. Uh, COVID was one disruption, but there's lots of disruptions. Again, I know many in the room know this, uh, and I know you experience this a lot in the Philippines with weather. Uh, I saw someone actually earlier on today said, "Good, you know, hello from kind of the rains. Uh, you know, these things disrupt school, right? Typhoons. So we need a resilient approach. It can't be a surprise every time. We need to have approaches that can work when these disruptions happen. And we're seeing that this phone-based approach can really work. It can reach people where they are. It can provide that quality education. So how do we build that into our resilience strategy? You can see here is a map of various kinds of disruptions in various countries over the years. Sometimes it's a flood. Uh, sometimes it's a monsoon rain. Sometimes it's an earthquake. Sometimes it's a water shortage. Sometimes it's pollution. Sometimes it's an earthquake. Sometimes it's an election. We have disruptions all the time, and we need evidence-based approaches to build resilience into the education system. There's a few themes and lessons. So one on the left here is around emergency responses and actually not treating them as a surprise, right? Having these resilient evidence-based tools and approaches like phone-based education. There's also non-emergency lessons around targeting instruction, around technology we know, there's a big focus on ICT and technology. 
Uh, but we also know technology is not always working for us. Sometimes we give people laptops and they don't use them or there's no internet connection. The nice thing about the phone is people already have it. So you can move away from the device to the program, right? You can kind of jump into the program. And so I think we need to think about technology, not just as the devices, uh, but actually using what people have and making it work. And then approaches around tutoring. These phone calls were one-on-one. -on -one. They were really cheap and scalable way of tutoring. So there's many themes here and lessons. And I didn't even mention caregiver engagement, which is so important. Okay, so next steps. One of the very exciting things is this study has worked. There's a strong collaboration with DepEd, and we've been in active conversations with DepEd about what it takes to scale. And I'd love to hear from people here. I see there's people from the region, headquarters, schools. I'd love to hear from people. What do you think it would take to get this really scaling across uh, in your regions, across the country, how, how to do it? I mean, you, you're the expert. So if you can guide and advise, we'd love to hear from you but we're in really exciting conversations about next steps. Okay. There's more to learn. We haven't learned everything. Yes, we have a lot of evidence, but we wanna keep learning. We wanna keep making it more cost-effective, more scalable. So we're gonna keep learning. Uh, and then we're also gonna try this, not just, we wanna try it in the normal school system, right? Through the kind of, even when there's no disruption, but we also wanna think about this disruption response. So we want both. How do we do it in business as usual? And how do we make it resilient to disruption? And so there's some really exciting discussions. The IPA team is leading with FARM and UNICEF around what this could look like uh, in that region. Okay, that's the end for me. Uh, and just to say again, what a treat it has been to collaborate uh, with the partners here. It really is, I think, one of the most exciting uh, efforts happening in education in the world uh, today. Uh, one of the most exciting efforts of connecting evidence to action of government leadership. And I'm just, I hope this is the beginning uh, and there's more to come. So thank you. And I'll turn it back to you, Isha.